united in the Spirit of God. Fill us with the Spirit of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'm very grateful that um, Elder David and Sister Kyoga are with us this morning. It's a blessing to have them again. And also Reverend Powie and Mrs. Powie be with us this morning as well. May I ask Reverend Powie to give final benediction and afterwards? Well, Song of Solomon, um, this is a beautiful book, but at the same time as a preacher, once in a while I was tempted to skip it. But as I'm going through all the books of the scriptures, I cannot do that. And the whole counsel of God must be diligently studied and preached. So finally we come to the book of the Song of Solomon. As far as I understand, wonderful preacher in the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon, was able to bring out 52 messages, as far as I remember, if my memory is correct, out of this book. And he was beautifully uh, talking about the love of God for his church and, and so on. But I do not have that much skill to bring out 50 to expo expository messages out of the Song of Solomon, and I have prepared the three messages, one for today and one for next Sunday, and um, one after uh, lunch uh, next week. The Song of Solomon is one of the smallest, the most difficult, but one of the most popular book with both Jews and Christians. Over the centuries, hundreds of books and commentaries have been written and unnumbered the sermons preached on these 117 verses. The book has attracted the attention of some of the best intellects and spiritual minds of the believing communities. In spite of its apparent simplicity, it poses a great number of major uh, interpretative, uh, tative, uh, interpretative uh, difficulties. This book is also called the Song of Songs, which comes from the first two words of the first verse in the Hebrew text. The most obvious meaning of this phrase follows from a recognition that the syntax, in this case, the use of the same word in construct relationship, first in the singular and the second time in the plural, the syntax denotes a superlative in, in uh, Hebrew. This, in other words, is the best song of all. Song of songs means that this is the best song of all songs. Grammatical analogies include the vanity of vanities, king of kings, and lord of lords, and holy of holies. So likewise, it, it is trying to expre express that this is the really supreme song of all the songs. This book is one of the five Megillot. Megillot is a term referring to five books of scrolls, which are Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentation, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. They are traditionally read publicly in the synagogues over the course of the year in many uh, Jewish communities. Song of Solomon is read publicly on the Sabbath of Passover, the eighth, of, eighth day of Passover. It is probably because this book was read as a historical allegory beginning with the Exodus and ending with the coming of the Messiah. You must have already noticed that um, Jews interpreted this book allegorically. The first verse of the book says, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. It is commonly understood to mean the most excellent of songs composed by Solomon. That is probably general understanding of that uh, first verse. From the rendering in the Latin Vergate, Canticum, Canticorum, which means a song of songs, comes the title Canticles. So in some commentaries or some books, instead of Song of, song of Solomon or Song of Songs, you will find the title Canticles. Toward the end of the first Christian century, the canonical authority of this book was disputed in certain quarters. So some people felt that this book should not be included in the 66 books of the Bible. Probably the ground of opposition was its non-religious character. For example, it does not contain the divine name in any of the book's 117 verses. 
However, we may find an exception from chapter 8, verse 6. If you read chapter 8, verse 6, it says this, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath the most vehement flame. We cannot find the name of God in this King James translation. However, the last word, flame, vehement flame, is translated as the very flame of the Lord by ESV and NASV, while as a mighty flame by the NIV. The Hebrew word for flame here is a compound word of flame and the Lord. However, as we have just observed, some translations do not show the word Lord in them. The Encyclopedia Judaica also understands the name of God here once as an expression of intensity rather than trying to display the name of God. But simply uh, the name of God is used to show its intensity. It is not the first and only instance in the Bible that divine truths are taught without mentioning the name of God. The book of Esther is a good example. And if you read the book of uh, Song of Solomon, Throughout this book, you cannot find the word like sin, forgiveness, or, or justice, or um, uh, sacrifices. All those religious terms are not found in this book. So some people in early centuries rejected to receive this book as a part of God's canon, the, the uh, canonical books, the 66 books of the Bible. It is hard to understand the book structurally. So some people say that this book has lots of poems. Some people say that this is just one poem. And even the divisions of a poem lines are so different from author to author. Maybe next to the book of Revelation, Song of Solomon has the most widely different structures that affect the way we understand the book. Probably what you see from the ESV translation is the best guess I'm not saying best translation, but it is the best to guess. If you read ESV translation for study purposes, you will see that there are headings in the book that you cannot find from King James or any other books. For example, before chapter 1, verse 2, you will see she. And then in the middle of verse 4, others. And then back to she before verse 5. And then you will see he in verse 8. What this translation is trying to do is to identify the speakers of each passage, though some could be disputed. So those um, words are not inspired words, but the translators put them there to help the readers to know who speaks what. It is a love song with no particular historical reference, so you cannot find any sort of historical account from the book. The Song of Solomon depicts love as very much sensuous. Its only ethical element is the devotion of one man to one woman in marriage. It is coded neither by Philo, who was the very well-known Jewish scholar in the first century, nor in the New Testament. But it appears to have gained popularity, and the probability is that at an early day, it was interpreted allegorically by the sages, and that it was on the basis of such an interpretation that its canonicity was finally established. So it was taken into 66 books um, by uh, all uh, believers. I will talk about its interpretation in my next message uh, next week. And there are different ways to interpret the book. First of all, let me begin with its author and the literary style. The first verse of the first chapter reads, The Song of so Songs, which is Solomon's. As we observed in the introduction, certain phrases used in repetitions like holy of holies, king of kings, lord of lords, or song of songs is an expression of emphasis. Thus, a song of songs refers to the best song. There are, first of all, different views of the authorship, its authorship. Some say that this book is about Solomon, not by Solomon. Or some say that it was attributed or dedicated to Solomon, but it was not written by Solomon. In this case, they deny the Solomon's authorship. If the natural reading is correct, 
Solomon must be its author. Solomon's name appears a few times in the book in chapter 1, chapter 3, and chapter 8. First Kings chapter 4, verse 32, talks about Solomon's ability to compose um, uh, poems. For example, First uh, Kings 4, 32 says, And Solomon spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He was capable of writing poems. Thus, we could say that this book is the best song among 1,005 songs he wrote. Some doubts may arise against his authorship. How could Solomon, the man who had 700 wives and 300 concubines, write such a romantic poem about marital love? Does he really understand what it means to love one another in marriage? In order to answer this question, some have argued that he wrote this song when he was younger, before he turned away and accumulated all of these wives and concubines. I do not know if it is true, but it sounds sensible. Some have said that Solomon must have written this poem when he was an old man, totally opposite view, and it was an act of contrition. Again, I do not know whether it is true, but surely I hope so if it is the case. For example, Midrash Rappa, rabbinical uh, interpretation and uh, discussions of the Bible. Midrash Rabbaka talks of the three main contributions of Solomon. They are Song of Solomon, uh, Song of Songs, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, as beginning to three phases of his life with explanation that when a man is young, he composes songs. So Song of Songs was composed. When he grows older, he makes uh, sententious remarks. So he makes a lot of proverbs. And when he became an old man, he speaks of the vanity of things. So that's why he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. I do not know whether that is true, but that is at least um, what um, um, rabbis are talking about. If we accept the Solomonic authorship, then it must be written about the middle of the 10th century BC. Secondly, it is similar to Egyptian poetry of this period that was right before Solomon. There is a huge difference between Egyptian love poems and the Canaanite and Mesopotamian love poetry. The Canaanite and Mesopotamian love poetry is almost completely associated with the fertility, fertility cult rituals, Baal or Enath or Demuji and uh, Inan, Inanna. So in other words, the temple prostitution, probably you have heard that term somewhere, somehow. In ancient pagan religion, temples were very much immoral and uh, they engaged themselves in sexual activities for religious causes and, re and reasons. So a lot of love poems were composed, but at, at the same time, the separation of the love element from the cultic elements, religious elements, is almost impossible. So love him, love him poems from Canaanite and Mesopotamian love poetry is almost 100% having some sort of religious connotation, pagan religion. However, the poems in the Song of Solomon are like the Egyptian love poetry, which is non-Kurtic type. This book bears all the characteristics of what we recognize as Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry does have a few, um, a few elements like a terseness, parallelism, imagery, and figurative language. Terseness simply describes the fact that Hebrew poetry is distinguished from prose by the brevity of its clause, short sentences, short phrases, while prose is constructed of sentences that form paragraphs that build longer discourse. Poetry is made up of short kola or rhythmical unit of utterance that form parallel lines. Poetry also occasionally omits words for various uh, reasons. So eclipses are there. So sometimes the sentences are not completed with words. Number two, parallelism is a widely recognized device of Hebrew poetry. 
In short, according to C.S. Lewis, parallelism, in quote, the practice of saying the same thing twice in different words, end of quote. So same thing is talked about in two different expressions. So for example, chapter 5, Song of Songs, Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 2, C says, my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. These two things are not talking about different things, but in, in fact, the second one is a repetition of the first thing with different expressions. So my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. According to C. Day Lewis, imagery is a picture made out of words. So by reading certain words, we can draw some sort of mental pictures in our minds. Such pictures are often the result of comparison, the two most common types being metaphor and simile. Simile is a comparison between two things and is marked by the use of like or as. So if you look at chapter 4, verse 1, C, it says, Thy hair is as a flock of goats. Thy hair is as a flock of goats. I do not know um, how you see this in this love poem. Someone who loves you so dearly comes to you and uh, he compliments you, something like, your hair is as a flock of goats. Um, I'm not sure how much you'll be impressed by that. But anyway, it gave an, an image into the minds of the people in those days. Metaphor is considered as the master image. It presents a stronger connection between two objects of comparison and is truly figurative language. For example, exactly the same verse, chapter 4, verse 1b says, Thou hast a dove's eyes. That doesn't mean that part of uh, her eyes, her body is, a, is, is of doves. The song's imagery will excite our sense, including sight, taste, touch, smell, and sound. The Song of Solomon is a love poem, which is intimate, sensual, and even erotic uh, passion. All of these characteristics of the poetry in this book will make it hard for us to understand its messages. And it talks about certain um, feelings of romance. The primary contents of the Song of Solomon must, must be of love. Uh, if you have uh, listened to anyone, uh, messages uh, uh, from this party, particular book in the past, my best guess is that um, allegorical interpretation was probably used so that the love here is not explained as a love between uh, a man and woman, but rather between Christ and his church. And I think there is uh, such an implication in it, and I I'm going to talk about it next week. But at the same time, we cannot ignore the literal senses of all these words in this book, so we need to go through this. Even more striking is the omission from the book of all the major religious words in the Old Testament vocabulary. This book speaks of romantic love. If you just read it as it is, every one of us has his or her own ideas of love. So first of all, there is the I, thou, I, you formulation like any love poems. For example, if you look at chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, would you like to turn your Bibles Eight verses 1 and 2, it says this. Oh, that thou wert as my brother that sucked the breast of my mother. When I should find thee without, I would kiss thee. Yea, I should not be despised. I would lead thee and bring thee into my mother's house who would instruct me. I would cause thee to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. So as you can see, I thou formulation is virtually everywhere in this book. And that is a common characteristic of love poem. Secondly, there are expressions of joy and excitement 
when the lovers find in each other's presence, like chapter four, verse four, or chapter six, uh, chapter seven, verses six to twelve. For example, chapter three, verse four says, "It was but a litter that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loveth. I beheld him and would not let him go." Until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. Thirdly, the bridegroom speaks of his beloved one's physical beauties in chapter four, verses one to fifteen. He describes her in verse uh, chapter four, verse one a. Probably you'd better turn your Bibles to chapter four, the Song of Solomon. Four a says, "Behold, thou art fair." My love, behold, thou art fair. The word "fair" means beautiful. The NIV, NASV, and NIV translate "my love" in King James as "my darling." Her eyes are like doves within a lux in chapter four, verse one b. Within thy lux means behind, um, behind your veil. The instruction of the veil at this point in the song. Underscores the marriage aspect. Normally, girls and women wear headdresses, but not veils, except for special occasions like engagement in Genesis chapter 24, an actual wedding celebration in Genesis chapter 29, and they are two examples we can find of wearing veil. Her hairs are like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. Most Palestinians, Palestinian goats have long, wavy black hair. So this image suggests the undulating flow and movement of her beautiful black hair from head to shoulders in chapter 4, verse 1c. And his teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shown, which came up from the washing or bearing twins in chapter 4, verse 2. What in the world? Her teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shown. Well, her teeth are white, neatly arranged like a flock of sheep, clean and white after washing. They are perfectly symmetrical and perfectly matched like twins. Remember that there were no dentist teeth cleaning services or toothpaste like today, and it must be a, a high honor. In fact, highly um, attractive. Her lips and mouth are lovely. Chapter 4, verse 3a says, Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet. They are red. Probably, thy speech is calmly here, means thy mouth is lovely, as in all other translations um, say. Her cheeks are beautiful. Chapter three, uh, chapter four, verse three B says, "Thy tempers are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks." The Hebrew word for temples is translated as cheeks in all other translations. The emphasis is on the beautiful rosy cheeks, which are like the color of the interior of a pomegranate cut into halves. Her neck is compared to the Tower of David. What a fantastic and attraction, fantastically, um, you know, attractive neck, Tower of David. Verse 4 says, Thy neck is like the Tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers or shields of mighty men. What is noticeable is that the tower is high. In ancient times, a long neck was considered elegantly graceful and reflects the beauty and noble temperament of a woman. Her neck is decorated with strings of colored beads, as in chapter 1, verse 10. The strings of beads on her neck are compared to a thousand shields of warriors hanging on the walls of the Tower of David. Her breasts are like two young rows that are twins. For, uh, verse 5 says, Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins, which feed among the lilies. Rows refer to fawns or gazelles. The description suggests the symmetry in texture and form. It is hard to know what it means that breasts are like fawns browsing among the lilies. 
There are many explanations of this description, but I would not go into any further, except saying that the lover, the groom, Solomon is emphasizing the tenderness and alluring beauty of his bride's breasts. Fourthly, the bride expresses her, expresses her lover's physical beauty in chapter 5, verses 10 to 16. It is quite unique because in chapter 4, the bride is explaining, uh, the groom is explaining the beauty of his, uh, his bride. And now is a, is, is a bride's turn. And bride is talking, bride is talking about his, uh, her groom. So chapter five, verse, uh, chapter five, verses 10 to 16, it is a way of expressing her love toward, toward him. Love songs describe, describing the physical beauty of the beloved are common in the ancient Near East, but most of them describe the female. That's why it is quite unique. Um, from a woman's point, point of view about men, such detailed description of the male as here is seldom recorded. The parts of the body praised are not necessarily flawless, but they are seen perfect in her eyes. Not necessarily really the man's body was perfect, but in her eyes, he was beautiful. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. After all, love is blind until the illusion is shattered. She describes his physical beauty from top to bottom. His face is white and ruddy. So chapter five, verse 10, A says, my beloved is white and ruddy. The Hebrew word for white means radiant, dazzling, clear, or bright. Rudy means red or brown. He must be radiantly bright and sunny person. It could mean that he was handsome with a healthy tan. He was the chiefest among 10,000. She was really blind. She compares him to others and says, he is really outstanding. He is really distinguished. I don't care what others are talking about the man, but my man is outstanding. He's the chiefest of 10,000. I hope that uh, all wives will say the same thing to their husbands tonight. You are outstanding. <laughs> and his head is as the most fine go gold. Verse 11a. Probably it does not refer to his head shape, but his face and neck altogether. It speaks of his radiant and golden healthy tan complexion. His hairs are bush and black as a raven. Verse 11b. His hairs are bush and black as a raven. I hope that you do not misunderstand meaning of bush. Um, sometimes some men are coming to church or some women are coming to church without making their hairs proper. Right from the bed they come, so they, their hairs are just sticking up and like a bush. No, no, no. It's, no, it's no good. I hope that you will make your hairs before you come to church or go to anywhere. That is not something that you can be proud of. Bush actually means wavy in ESV and NIV, and the NASB translates it as clusters of dates. It probably refers to his long flowing black hair. And his eyes are like eyes of doves. His eyes, verse 12, his eyes are as the, as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters washed with milk and fitly set. It must be a description of beautiful eyes. So his eyes must be beautiful, at least in our eyes. If you have seen doves eyes, you must know what I mean. It is interesting that the description of the eyes takes up twice as such a space as that of other features mentioned in this book. It could mean that his eyes are most fascinating to her. When she sees her, she's, his eyes, he's, she's just fallen in love with him. It could mean that his eyes are most fascinating to her. His passionate love seems to have beamed through his eyes. Again, it is another symbolic expression of her deep feelings for, for him. And his cheeks are as a bed of spices like sweet flowers. Verse 13a. 
It probably is a description of his beard. Considering that, as far as we can tell, men in all periods of Israel's history wore beards. Interestingly, the emphasis that is placed upon his beard has nothing to do with his its looks, even though he talks about beards, but it does not have anything to do with its looks, but rather it's a smell. Verse 13a, as a bed of spices flutter like sweet flowers. It is as a bed of spices. Possibly this olfactory image implies a certain physical closeness as well as a desire to get even closer. His lips are like lilies dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. In verse 13b, I'm not sure what she wants to describe his lips by comparing it to lilies. However, probably it speaks of the enlivening effect of their kisses, according to O'Keel. By reading this description of his lips, there is no question that his lips arouse a desire in her. And his hands are as, as gold rings set with a beryl in verse 14a. His strong arms are portrayed as round and solid with a string of precious stones on his arm. In other words, he looks manly and he looks really muscular. And now we come to his belly. Verse 14b, his belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. ESV says his body is polished ivory, bedecked with the sapphires. NASB says his abdomen is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. And NIV says his body is like polished ivory decorated with lapis lazuli which means um, rich blue gemstone with specks of gold and often white. She describes his smooth, flat, and muscular stomach as compared to the smooth, flat, and polished ivory, ivory bar. So all those ones who have big bellies, man, we got to exercise. Um, and um, verse 16a, his legs are as pillars of marbles set upon sockets of fine gold. And uh, his countenance, ESV says um, mouth, or NASV and NIV says appearance. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the Siddars in verse 16b, which he means probably he's very tall and he's very strong and he's very handsome. And a splendid guy like Siddars of Lebanon, because Siddars of Lebanon were the best sort of, uh, um, of, of trees, a uh, tree recognized in, even in the scriptures. T. Gladhill says, in quote, nothing is too exotic or extravagant to describe this incomparable young man. His magnificence, his splendor is almost out of this world. His triumphant verbal description has overwhelmed both herself and her skeptical companions. If she has gone overboard in her poetic metaphors, well, that is excusable. After all, she is totally and irrevocably, irre irrevocably overwhelmed with her lover, end of quote. The bridegroom responds to his lover's affirmation in chapter six, verses four to 10. So verse chapter four, was a bride talk, and chapter five, it was um, uh, the groom's talk, and chapter five, a bride's talk, and now chapter six, again, it goes back to the groom. He praises of her beauty in chapter six, verse four. Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tirzah, calmly as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. NASB and NIV say this, my darling, so instead of, uh, oh, my love, he says, my darling. He begins the praise by comparing her beauty to Tirzah. Tirzah was the first capital of the northern kingdom of Israel after the breakup with the Davidic uh, dynasty. It has been described as a place of general, natural, and rustic beauty. There was abundant water supply. He compares her beauty to Jerusalem, too. In Psalm 50, 5, 0, verse 2, 
Jerusalem is described as a perfection of beauty. Therefore, he uses two great and magnificent places to illustrate the grandeur, dignity, and the loftiness of her imposing beauty. And she is terrible, which means awesome. She is as awesome as an army with banners. We find a similar uh, expression in chapter 6, verse 10, saying, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible or awesome as an army with banners? Would you like to turn your Bibles to chapter 6, verse 10? I found this verse to know the meaning of the army with the banners. Uh, then I found that uh, there is the same expression here. Um, verse 10, would you like to read it together? Who is she that looketh forth as the moon? I mean, so again, the terrible means awesome. I wonder if any man could find a better words than these to describe his lover. NIV describes it even more graphically. NIV says this, who is this that appears like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, majestic as the stars in procession? She is awesomely and imposingly beautiful like this, like the moon, the sun, and the stars are phenomenally arrayed in the sky. Her beauty is like the majestic epiphany of ethereal beauty descending from heaven. If we read chapter 6, verse 4 and 10 together, we'll find an interesting arrangement. In chapter 6, verse 10, he raises a question. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? He raises a question in ch chapter 6, verse 10. Then it seems that chapter 6, the same chapter, verse 4, already knows the answer. Because um, verse 4 answers this question. He says, thou art beautiful, O my love. Her eyes are too beautiful to look at. Chapter 6, verse 5a. It's just amazing expression. So groom says to the bride, turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. In chapter 4, verse 1, her eyes are compared to dove's eyes, but there is no comparison in chapter 6, verse 5. Instead, the effect of looking at, uh, looking at her eyes is vividly portrayed. Thus, he has to say, Basically, it is, it is what he says. It is too much for me to look at your eyes. I am just overwhelmed. Turn your eyes away from me. I can bear it anymore. Do you think that is a beautiful expression of um, a young man falling in love with someone? As she casts her eyes on him, he can hardly resist the magnetic power of her eyes. Her hairs, her teeth, and temples are also so attractive. Verses 5b to 7, they are basically repetitions of chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. She's the fairest of all. Verses 8 and 9. Let's read verses 8 and 9. Chapter 6. There are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. My dog, my undefiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice of one of her that bear her. The daughters saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Amen. He compared his, his bride to the 60 queens, 80 concubines, and countless number of virgins or maidens. None could be compared to her in terms of beauty and the loveliness in his own eyes. He does not call her queen or concubine 
or maiden, but my dog, my undefiled, which means my perfect or complete one. And he called her as only one of her mother and the choice one of her that bear her. She has such an admiration of her high morality and fine character. In chapter 2, verse 2, he says, As the lily among thorns, so, so is my love among the daughters. Let me read it again. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. She is outstanding among all women, so much so that even queens look like thorns. So he compares his bride with other women and he says they are just thistles. They are just like wheat. She is so lovely and she is the lily among the thorns. She is outstanding. M.B. Fox says, in quote, there are numerous queens and noble ladies around, but my beloved is one of a kind. None of them can compare to her and what's more, even they recognize her majesty, end of quote. The bridegroom praises her beauty in chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. So again, the groom's speech. This passage sounds like a reply to the question in chapter 6, verse 13b. 13b says, who will he see in the Shilamite? So he's answering to that question. What are you going to talk about, my beloved Shulamite? Verse 1, her feet and legs are beautiful. Verse 1 says, how beautiful are thy feet with the shoes, O prince, prince's daughter. The joints of thy thighs are like jewels, and the work of the hands of a cunning workman. He called her a prince's daughter, which is a term of both endearment and Nobility. So because of this expression, some people say that probably it is referring to Pharaoh's daughter who married um, uh, Solomon, but um, it, has not, it has not been accepted by all. Probably Shulamite was not a prince's daughter or Egyptian princess. It must be his emotive response to her beauty. He could not express her, his feeling about her um, in any other way but to give her the best sort of title he could think of. She is of gracious and noble character. Her feet with the shoes, her sandaled feet look beautiful. Her legs are beautiful too. ESV says, your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a master hand. And ASV says, the curves of your hips are like jewels, the work of the hands of an artist. NIV says, your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of an artist's hands. It may not be a visual description, but his feelings are toward her. In his eyes, she's like a sculpture being shaped to perfection by the hands of a skillful sculptor. Her neighbor is like a round goblet. Verse 2, A says, thy neighbor is like a round goblet which wanteth not liquor. The neighbor is a round goblet or, or bowl, bowl. A goblet filled with blended wine is attractive and stimulating. When a person gazes at the sparkling blended, a blended red wine, he will be stimulated and attracted to it and lose control of himself. The stimulating attractiveness of the neighbor is thus being emphasized here. Her belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Verse 2b, the color of her belly is golden brown like a mount of wheat. It is encircled by a heap or garland of beautiful lilies. Her breasts like, are like a two young rows that are twin. It is a repetition of chapter 4 verse 5. Her neck is once again is like a tower of ivory. Well, in chapter 4, verse 4, her neck is likened to, to David's tower. An ivory tower is smooth, its color is pale but pleasing in appearance. The tower can be splendidly upright. It also may refer to a long neck. Her swept up hair would reveal the uh, stat stature of her smooth, pale neck erect, a tower of ivory tall, according to Gladhill. Her eyes are like the fish pools in Heshbon. 
verse 4b. The pools of Heshbon refer to, to the huge cistern in Hebron. A cistern is not a running spring, spring, but the pool hewn out of a solid rock for storing water. Stillness, clarity, and depth characterize the water in a large cistern. When he looks into her eyes, her calmness, depth, and tranquil profundity indeed attract him. Her nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. Again, her nose is tower, like the Tower of Lebanon. I don't know how you could find any attraction from the nose look like the Tower of Lebanon. But Tower of Lebanon probably situated at the top, on the top of Mount, Mount Lebanon. It is standing upright into the sky, overlooking Damascus. It apply, it aptly, um, in fact, illustrates her nose, nose's prominence, matching her beautiful complexion. Her head is like a caramel, and her hairs are like a purple. Verse 5. B, chapter 7, her head is covered by a hair of a dark purple sheen. A long flowing tresses beautifully cover her head with the shoulders, head and shoulders, like a crown on her head. As we have seen so far, the bride and her groom praise each other's beauty. This book also speaks of these two lovers longing for physical intimacy. In my second message from this book, I'll briefly speak about the interpretations of this book, probably mainly on the interpretation of the book. And so based on interpretations, different people have understood the book, this book differently. However, we cannot deny that the natural meaning of this, this book, literal meaning of this book is a description of a love between a two lovers man and his wife, or groom and his, his um, bride. The Song of Solomon is an example of a universal type of poem, which is the love poem. Although this book is a relatively short book of only 117 verses, it has an unusually large number of uncommon words. Of the approximately 470 different Hebrew words it contains, a very high number for such a small book. 47 occur only in this book. In some cases, some words occur only once in the whole Bible and nowhere else in the Old Testament. 51 occur five times or less and 45 occur between six and 10 times and an additional 27 between 11 and 20 times, leaving about 300 common words in the book. Probably, it tells us that it is very uncommon book, and it also tells us that love evokes our emotions very widely and uniquely. We will be able to find a few principles of love and intimacy from the book. Number one, love and intimacy are God's gifts, which are good, and it is described in, in the Holy Bible. It means that God has given these the things to us for our happiness and pleasure. It means that they are blessings to us if we use them properly. However, they can be perverted and corrupt like all other God's gifts. It means that we ought to protect their purity and use them as God purposes. Number two, love and intimacy must be consummated and enjoyed only in marriage. C.S. Lewis said that I thought it was interesting. Um, I'm not in agreement with C.S. Lewis over all things, but sometimes his insights are just remarkable. And one of, one of, it, one of them is this. He says that Christ, Christian sexual ethic is so difficult and so contrary to our instincts that obviously either Christian is wrong or our sexual instinct is wrong, one or the other, end of quote. The human sexual instinct is to want sex and to want it on our own terms and to want it now. Christianity gives a fundamentally different messages. It is so different that either our natural sexual instinct is right and to be trusted or Christianity is right. People in the world have chosen their sexual instinct over 
the teachings in Christianity. Number three, love and intimacy in Christian marriage must be pure, faithful, and passionate. You know, Christian couples must be passionate. Why can't we be not passionate in, in our marriage? Christians ought not to defile the bed in marriage. Unfortunately, some Christian couples in marriage are not connected but disconnected. Instead, they are connected to internet, pornography. Pornography has been a serious problem not only to this society but to Christian men and women. Number four, love and intimacy must be devoted to and shared only within marriage. In order to uphold these principles well, we must not forget that we must put lots of efforts to, to build up relationships within the marriage. Love is a committed devotion. We must be committed to each other in marriage. Um, someone said something like this. These days, longevity is, uh, is, is a kind of common talk. Our, I, I'm not sure exact figure of it average age of Australians, maybe mid-80s, and we have met a lot of um, centurions as well. So let me suppose that we marry around 30 and have children, and they marry in, uh, around at the age of 30, and, and then our children grow and they marry around when we are 60 years old. Then if we live up to 90 years or 100, then we are going to live for 30 to 40 years only for ourselves. Between, only husband and wife are left at home and children are gone out to make their homes. So 30 to 40 years, we have to face each other every morning, every afternoon, every evening. 30 years and 40 years, if we have not, able, if we have not been able to build up our relationship, how can we endure three decades or four decades living together with that man or that woman. We have to put lots of efforts into marriage relationship. The relationship between husband and wife precedes to all other relationships. Children are precious, but do not misunderstand them. They are not, they should not be your number one concern because someday they will leave and you are going to live with your spouse, care for your spouse, and uh, look after her or him. It reminds me to say of one more thing. Good marital relationship is not a natural outcome of marriage. If we just live together, you know, we'll live together anyway, so our marriage will be okay. No, it doesn't work that way. We have a corrupt nature and we have imperfect temperaments if we do not work hard to build up a good relationship between husband and wife we will not be able to have it both man and woman must work hard to build a close and intimate relationship in marriage where career is important work is important make money is important but don't you know that someday you are going to retire from your work i don't know what age you want to retire, 65 or 70 or 75, but, but still you have two or three more decades to live with your spouses. Build up your relationship. Your number one attention must be given to your spouse. Both men and women must work harder to build a close and intimate relationship in marriage. Husband and wife, love your spouse as Christ loves you. Having thought of all these things, even to the unmarried people or the singles who are going to marry eventually in the future, remember that to build up a good relationship together as a couple, you must have the same foundation. That's why you need to marry in the Lord. Remember that. Without the same foundation, your house may be weakened. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we are very thankful for your creation of men and women. And besides that, Lord, in your divine providence and divine will, you instituted the marriage for men and women. So they are to be united, to be one. Dear gracious Lord, we do thank you for that intimate relationship. 
Dear Heavenly Father, as the book of the Song of Solomon literally describes, we pray that you will help us to, to love um, our uh, dear spouses and uh, our loved ones, Lord, as Christ loves his own church. Dear Father, even though we are imperfect, by the grace of God, in the will of God, as we um, obey unto the commandments of God, we shall build up that relationship. Bless us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.